things clear while we're here. And hopefully this gathering that we have here keep growing, keeps growing. The purpose of this youth program that Allah SWT has blessed us with is no other than to raise the level of consciousness among our youth. The youth of this Ummah is one of the most important aspects of the Ummah of Rasulullah if not the most, if not the most, which is why this institution has put forth all kinds of resources at our disposal in order for you to use it for your own benefit. So don't come here and waste the time and waste the resources of this institution. While you're here, make sure that you're disciplined. While you're here, make sure that your behavior is at the highest level. If you behave a certain way in the streets, make sure the minute you walk into the house of Allah SWT, make sure that whatever you're doing outside, make sure you check yourself. Make sure that you are in the presence of Allah SWT. That's the first rule. The second rule, this program is not a babysitting program. Therefore, we do not spend, we do not want to spend time chasing people around. We do not want to spend time looking for you outside, running after you, yelling after you, while this program is going on. So let's get an understanding of this. Every single time the program starts at 6 p.m. 6 p.m. When 6 p.m. hits, make sure that you're inside the masjid. When 6 p.m. hits, inshallah, make sure that you're inside the masjid. Make sure that there's nobody outside calling out to you, asking you to come into the masjid. That should be understood from the get-go. This program has been put together by a group of wonderful brothers. Inshallah and wallahi, I'm so happy that they've allowed me to be part of it. And this program actually was put also put together by youth among your peers. I'm talking to the youth. People that you know very well. People that you play basketball with. People that you sometimes hang out with, go to the movies with. They're the ones who put together this program. It had nothing to do with me, Brother Amir, Brother uh, Ahmed Azam. It had nothing to do with us. Brother Rami, none of it. I'm not going to cite names. But the fact that they have been capable to, putting, to put this whole thing together shows you your potential. And hopefully, inshallah, and by Allah, this is just the beginning of something greater. We're going to kick off this program, inshallah, with one of our young brothers. Oh, I don't know if he remembers it. When I first moved to this community, he's the first contact I've had among the Salam School students. And he gave an interview because he was in the school's paper. SubhanAllah, from that moment on, I became very impressed with him. That every time something like this came up, I had his name in mind, inshallah. His name is Muhammad Musaydin. And he's going to give us a short khatira, inshallah. And only he knows the subject, inshallah. Muhammad Musaydin. Salaam alaikum wa rahmatullah. We only had seven people attend the salah. Last year, Sheikh, Sheikh Yaa said, asked his father, would you have ever imagined that time back in the 60s? Then the year 2010, we would have the number of masajid and people attending the salahs that we have today. He replied to his son, you would, I would never have imagined this in a million of years. Islam has grown in America to the point where they are turning old churches and other institutions into masajid. This is the good news. The bad news, however, is that the increase in numbers we have is mostly due to the number of immigrants that we have that are coming here and moving here. If you, if you haven't noticed, if you look around, you don't really see third generation Muslims that much. Mostly all you see is second generation, as the third generation has become lost and are no longer found among us. What will happen when the third generation Muslims come after us? Are they too wrong to be lost? Will we be able to maintain that we keep on the path of Islam? We need to make sure that we ourselves are in order to maintain and keep them in check. Along the East Coast, the Jewish community has been in decline, and they have calculated that in the next 50 to 60 years, their community will die out. And this is due because their youth are not being uh, active in their community. If we, if we keep sleeping and we don't do our responsibilities now as Muslims, this too will be our faith. Like Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhu once said, there will be people of our ummah who will be sleeping, and they will not wake up until they are dead. They will not realize that they have to change themselves until it's going to be too late. I have a story I want to share with you guys. Maybe some of you guys heard it before. A couple of years ago in New Jersey, there was a young teenager 
who he would tell his father like every weekend that he wants to go to Kiyan in New York and he would go there and he'd take his car and his dad trusted him to go but he abused his dad's trust. He would go to New York, he'd be partying, he will go clubbing, he will do all this bad stuff that his dad never knew. Until one day he got in a really bad car accident. What happened was that he ended up dying and his girlfriend that was with him in the car, she ended up living. She lived to tell the tale of what he would do every weekend and this is a message for all of us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. وَلَقَدْ ذَرَعْنَا لِجَهَنَّمَ كَثِيرًا مِنَ الْجِنِّ وَالْإِنسِ لَهُمْ قُلُوبٌ لَا يَفْقَهُونَ بِهَا وَلَهُمْ أَعْيَنٌ لَا يُسِرُونَ بِهَا وَلَهُمْ آذَانٌ لَا يَسْمَعُونَ بِهَا أُولَئِكَ كَالْأَنْعَامِ بَلْ هُمْ أَضَلُّ وَأُولَئِكَ هُمْ الْغَافِلُونَ Already we have urged on to help many of the jinn and humankind Having hearts wherewith they understand not Having eyes wherewith they see not, having ears wherewith they hear not, these are as a cattle, nay, they are worse, these are the neglectful. We don't want to be like those who are worse than cattle, who are heedless. We need to bring ourselves back up to being leaders of the world as we once used to be. And in Dvisi and Turkey made the elaborate and most complete description of the map in the medieval times. The Ben Musa brothers wrote the book on engineering which illustrated the works of mechanics in the 12th century. al Khwarizmi founded Algebra. Abbas ibn Farnas made the first sky glider and was in the air for several minutes before he landed badly. We used to be the, Muslim, the leaders of the world and we became lazy and we lost everything. Nowadays, Muslims are viewed negatively and it is up to us to change this impression and wake up. <coughs> Some people use this as an excuse. This. They say, no matter what we do, people will not listen or accept us. This is not true, because if we act the way Muslims are supposed to act, and we can be leaders in our communities, they have no choice but to view us differently. I want everybody to do something real quick. Just do like, I want everybody to just do like this. Just do like this. Put their fingers together and like put it out in front of them. So you guys can Okay, all right, everybody just look at it. Just move a little bit. And now go ahead and put it on your chin real fast. Yeah, I see a lot of you guys put it on your forehead because you guys see me do it too. <laughs> this goes to show you that people will adhere to what they see over what they will hear. They say that the youth, they're the future of Islam. This is not, I don't think this is the case. I think we are the present of Islam, we are the now of Islam. Uh, we need to make up, we need to wake up, make a difference because we are because of Islam. Sorry. Assalamu alaikum everyone. And it's my first time getting khatra, so here we go. You can tell it's your first time. <laughs> so uh, my title is about the Saitan. And the is uh, you don't want to go home. <laughs> uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say, says in the Surah al Baqarah uh, that uh, Say, 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 what's going on? What's going on? Coach, what? Coach, what? That's what boring us to death. No! No! Don't ever show your face in the messenger. No! Stay down. No!
There are laws in the middle to make sure that you, youth, stay away from the masjid and Islam as much as possible. And by the way, don't take this as a lecture. I want to speak to every single one of you, individually. This is a serious problem. I'll give you examples that I've personally seen. The wedge between us and, and Islam right now is this shamelessness. You can, I was on the other, other day, driving, and the red light happened, and the window was down. And with my family, I'm sitting in the car, and the window is down, and somebody's jamming lyrics, and subhanAllah, such disgusting lyrics. I mean, we had this blushiness on our face as we're looking at our family, subhanAllah, listening to this garbage. But this is the wedge that we and every single one of us has to face. That's tactic number one. You know what tactic number two is? It's just even more dangerous. They say that once you put a wedge in the middle, now if you want to make sure that these youth never wake up, if you want to make sure that these youth remain sleeping, remain distracted with Facebook, that these youth remain distracted with Twitter, if you want to make sure, as a Russian writer writes, if you want to make sure that this nation never rises again, and these youth to make sure that they never challenge the authority. If you want to make sure that these youth remain mentally enslaved and spiritually dead and mentally dead. If you want to make sure that these youth never find out that Islam used to rule two thirds of the world where the Arabic language would be the scientific language. You know how English today is? Where every country kind of has to know English because like the currency through which people communicate, guess what? Arabic used to be like that. To make sure that the youth never reach that level again, you know what you have to do, the Russian writer writes? To make sure they never rise again, summon their roots. Cut them off from their heroes. Cut them off from their past. Because once they are cut from their past, they will never aspire to reach that level again. Give you an example. Let me, how, give, give me a show of hands. How many of you know Frederick Douglass? Give me a raise of hands. Yeah, you got it in AP US history or US history or whatever levels there are. You know, Frederick Douglass, he says that I was brought from Africa, snatched away from my homeland, along with so many of my relatives. We were thrown on slave ships, and then we were brought to America. But this country, America, that we love, our great country, unfortunately, the roots of this country were built upon the sweaty and bloody backs of these slaves. Even the sharks in the ocean knew that the fastest way to get fat is to follow those slave ships because any slave that would give them problem would be chucked over. That's how these sharks got fed. This is the reality, unfortunately. So Frederick Douglass says that when we landed in America, we were divided in three groups. I want you to pay attention to this, what he went through. And when you get become cut off from your roots, what can happen to you? He said we landed on America, divided in three groups. Group number one, who they call the natural slaves. These were the people who wouldn't give them any problem. They were the scums of society. They didn't know anything about African heritage, African civilization, knew with no knowledge of their past. In fact, they look, looked up to the slave master, tried to imitate the slave master. So they became immediately enslaved. Kind of like the youth do today, where we look up to Eminem and Fidi said, and we look at them as our role models. Because those blacks at that time, they looked up to the slave master, they became naturally enslaved. Second group, they said these are slightly problematic. What we gotta do with these guys, a little bit of whipping, a little bit of torture, and they'll come and join the group number one. And then, then there was that third group. Third group. They said this third group knew how to read and write, number one, knew how to read and write. Number two, and I'm reading to you the biography of Frederick Douglass himself, autobiography. He said that the second group, third group, knew how to read and write. They knew about the African culture and how great of a civilization Africa itself was. And because they knew all of that, it would be very hard for them to become enslaved. So what they would do is that they would take this third group and send them to this guy named Kavi, who was known as the Negro Breaker, Soul Breaker. And this guy would torture, whip, crush their soul to a point that that person who had this little leadership and self-respect they get would lose all of them. And then they would join the group number two and group So if we do not have connection to our past, if we don't know who our giants are, if we don't know who our heroes are, you know what happens? The, the void that is then filled by shaitan, and that's where Justin Bieber steps in and becomes a role model that he had no right to be. SubhanAllah. And Frederick Douglass, 
he continues on in his biography. He said that my, this cubby guy would torture me every day. Beat me up. He says, one day I was working out in the burning sun. And he said, I had eaten or drank anything. And he's working on this grain smashing machine. So it creates this fan-like sound. So he said, I'm working with three slaves. And we're working on this machine. He said, any one slave, if he stops, the work of all three slaves stops. So he says, out of dizziness and hunger and thirst and, and this hot weather, he said, I collapsed. He said, when I collapsed, the fan sound stopped because everybody stopped because of me. He said, he said, he said, he said that the fan sound stopped because I fell down. He said, Covey noticed that the sound of the fan stopped. He came rushing out. And here is this animal human being who looks at another human being, thirsty, hungry, scrawny. Instead of feeling mercy, you know what he does? He comes and gives him a soccer kick right on his ribs, both sides. And then he takes this metal thing and he cracks his head. Not all the way, but he cracks his head until blood is free flow, freely flowing. He said, anyways, this would continue on until one day I got fed up and I fought back my master. He said, the day I fought him back is the day I became a true man. So you and me, my dear brothers and sisters, you have to fight these wedges that have been put in the middle. You have to fight through this fitna of Facebook and Twitter and everything that we unfortunately have been bombarded with. I mean, subhanAllah, I have a hair class here that I teach. In about 15 students. Alhamdulillah, we are dedicated to memorizing the Quran. Is Taha here in the Quran? Taha, stand up. Real quick. So, subhanAllah, in our hips class, Taha just mem finished memorizing the entire Quran just on December 9th, right? Yesterday, subhanAllah, I went to his house and I listened to his final page. This is what youth can accomplish if in this kid, subhanAllah, wakes up every day in the morning before he goes to school, memorizes two pages, comes out, comes home at night. 11 year old. He just turned 11 and he does another page of memorization. <laughs> this is the kind of youth we want to produce. And you know what? Guess, guess what? We do our class Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. I got done with my class. And this, I'm, 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 the reason I'm bringing this up, that these wedges, they're keeping our youth away from the Muslim. I got done with my class. I go downstairs. You know what happens? These mashallah kids in our class, they're disciplined. They don't cuss. And subhanAllah, they don't talk back, let alone cuss. We head downstairs, and we have not stepped into the hallway that someone drops the ethanol and spreads the disgustingness all over. It's a serious problem. And the youth who know, who experience this, know what I'm talking about. Allah, we gotta stop this. This is a wretch that we have to fight through just like Frederick. You know, the, other, the few, few weeks back, and subhanAllah, these wedges, some of them are just silly. The other few weeks back, I was coming to the masjid, and I was late for prayer. So the first rakah had started. Here I am rushing and trying to get my shoes on and I couldn't put my shoes on the floor because you know Shia Zahn is going to hide it. So I had to put my shoes inside and I had to rush into the masjid and here I am trying to rush and there are two, three youth outside playing on their eye touch for life. And you know what they're playing? Fruit Ninja, man. Fruit Ninja! Of all things that's... If Fruit Ninja is enough to keep you from masjid, imagine the Dajjal comes down. And he's going to have, trust me, a lot more than Fruit Ninja. And this guy, and I'm hearing their conversation as I'm rushing through. This guy is like, yo, check out the fruit combo I just made, seven in a row. And I'm like, Allah, you're screwed, man. <laughs> we're just screwed. Our next generation is in trouble. And this is the reason we're starting this program. So you guys understand that they're being buried in Facebook. And these problems, if you don't wake up, if you don't wake up, then a few years from now, nobody will be filling these rooms. You know, your parents care right now and they bring you here. But if you don't care, if you don't care, no one be, nobody will be filling these roles 30 years from now. And the Sahaba that I wanted to talk about today, his name is Sanan al farsi The reason I chose him, because in his life, he fought through so many wedges, so many troubles, and he overcame them all just to seek the truth. Such an amazing, amazing story that you listen to his story and it makes you humble. What a man and what a sacrifice. Really, I hope you can listen to his story and leave with a better role model in your head. Who's Salman al Farsi? Born in Iran, Asfahan. The name of the city is Asfahan. 
He's born and he's a fire worshiper. Not a Jew, not a Christian, obviously not a Muslim. He's a fire worshiper. His father is rich, has a lot of respect in the community. And his father has so much influence that he got Salman al Farisi, who was from a young age very serious about religion. He got Salman the role of keeping the fire in the masjid. He's a fire worshiper, he maintains the fire. You know how kind of like we have Hafif today? Big shot titles? No, we don't know. Oh, mashallah, Hafif. In their, in their town, the maintainer of the fire was like a big shot kid. He has this huge title. His father is rich, respecting the community. And his father, that's his only child. So all the money he showers it upon, Salman al Farisi. And his father is so overprotective that he does not let him go outside of the house. Kind of like a slave girl. He's just locked inside the house. He does not want to let him go out for food or anything. Everything is brought to him on a silver platter. Now Salman has every reason to become a spoiled rich kid. So one day what happens in SubhanAllah, in this story you'll notice how Allah is in charge of everything. You know, the human beings can do whatever they want. It's kind of like the story of Yusuf Islam, in a prison, in a well. But Allah still makes him almost the president of Egypt. Because he wanted to. Watch the story of Salman. He'll go through crazy troubles. But Allah is all. Allahu Allah ala Allah is in charge of all affairs. What happens? His father doesn't let him go out. But one day his father got busy with some business. So he had no chance but to send Salman on a trip to the countryside to take care of some customers. So he says, Salman, just go take care of some business. He said, my son, you know how much I love you, right? And if you're going to be late, I'm going to be really worried. So Salman, he said, yeah, dad, I'll be back in time. Just, cool. Just be cool. So he leaves the house. And he's on the way to take care of the business of his father. On the way to, the, to that business trip, he sees a church on the side. Look at the miracle of Allah that that church, Allah, not to some, the Christians who believe in three and one and one in three, and God is a son, daughter, mother, everything. No, these were true Christians who believed in the oneness of Allah. So he looked at their prayer service. And he was amazed, subhanAllah, they're not worshipping some fire that goes down and you have to put oil to rekindle it. They're worshipping the Creator. He really got appealed to his fitrah, his heart. So he came and he stayed there all day. He's so impressed. He stayed there all day. His father is worried, sick to appoint his people going outside looking for him. Where's my son? The only son who I keep him locked up. One day I let him go and he's not coming back. Father is running sick. And at sunset time, the sun finally comes back. So the man is back. And see, he's not like a youth who sneaks out behind his parents' back and then he makes up some sort of an excuse. Straight up to his dad. Dad's like, so where were you? He said, Dad, I saw a church and I really like their service. So the father's like, man, don't let those fools fool you, man. Our religion is right. He's like, he can look to the man and Farsi. Although he's an obedient child, but he stood up for the truth. He's like, my father, Wallahi, their religion is better than mine. Although he's been in their religion since he was born. So father becomes even more worried and he has a channel and shackle does not let him leave. And he's wearing these shackles all the time because his father is afraid that well, he's going to become a Christian. Long story short, before Salman al Farisi had left that church, he had told the people in the church, make sure if there is, he had asked them, where did your religion start? They said, our religion started in Quds, in Bilal al -Shan. He said, if there's a caravan leading to Bilal al-Sham, make sure you tell me about it. So, the priest in that church sent a secret message to Salman al farisi that there's a caravan leading. Salman gives up his comfort, father, family, everything. And he joins that caravan. Ends up all the way in China. New country, new language, new people. All why? To seek the truth. And subhanAllah, here we are. Where it's hard for us to give up our Saturday nights to come and listen to our halal. SubhanAllah. So many youth are like, brother, brother, we this Saturday is only chill day we get, and it's Saturday halal on Saturday? We already have youth now for that, SubhanAllah. Here's Salman al Farisi, he's willing to give up everything, and he's young. So he goes to Shah, and he goes there, and he says, Who's the best teacher? Best was the best knowledge of religion. They say this priest right there. He goes up to that priest and he says, can I study with you? He said, yes. And he said that I started studying with that priest and he said it turned out that that priest was a super evil man. He used to take people's money in charity and store it for themselves until he had seven barrels of gold stored up all for himself. He said, I hated him so much because of that. He said, when the priest died and the people came to give him a burial, 
to give him a burial. He's like, man, that's an evil guy. They're like, man, how dare you speak about our priest like that? He's like, I'll show you the seven crates of gold that he has hoarded for himself. So they got so angry that they stoned his dead body. And they also crucified him because he was exposed. Now, so man in fantasy has an excuse because he, see, he came all this far to seek knowledge of religion. And the priest wasn't up to his expectation. Suppose you guys came Saturday night and the halakha was boring. We're never going back again. Salman had that excuse. Man, screw these guys. I'm not learning religion no more. These are all crooks and cheaters, liars. But no, he stayed firm. And Allah replaced that priest with another priest which he said was such an amazing person that I've never seen anyone more devout with his five daily prayers. More devout to Allah. And he said, I loved him like never loved anyone before. So Salman continued to study with him, but the man was old and he died. When he died, Salman goes to his bedside and he said, Oh, oh my teacher, I gave my life and soul and I loved you like I never loved anybody before. You're dying. How should I continue my studies? So the priest says, Oh my son, by Allah, I know of no one who believes in the Tawheed of Allah like I do all these Christians. There are three in one now, one in three, where Mary is God and Jesus is God. And now there's saints are God in the middle. They got all these intermediaries. He's like, no one I know that believes the same way we do. He's like, but there's a man in Musa in Iraq, that's where you gotta go. He gives up Bilal al-Sham, goes all the way to Iraq to seek knowledge. He goes to Iraq, and then again the priest is an old man. And slowly he dies out. And when he's on his deathbed, so the man of the the same thing. He's like, who should I study with now? He said that I know of no one except one priest living in Nasibin somewhere. You gotta go there to seek knowledge. See, there are, I know there are youth here who are coming all the way from Brookfield. And I also know you who live a block from the Masjid Barnabi. It's your choice. It's your choice. Here is the man of the travels all the way to Nasibin. Just to seek knowledge. He goes there, finds another old man, with whom he spends maybe a few months. And now the man is about to die. And listen to this. Because this really hits me deep. On his deathbed, he asks him, who should I continue studying? With? He said, oh my son, our race is dying off. We don't know a lot of people who worship and believe like you do. Our race is dying off. The priests are dying off. I only know of one man, only one man in Turkey, Amuria. Only men left. Do you know why they're dying off, my youth, my dear brothers and sisters? Do you know why they're dying off? Because they're not passing on the knowledge to their youth. This is why. That's why when that priest dies off, he did not leave behind a legacy of you guys. He dies off, the knowledge dies with him, no one to carry on the legacy. This is the reason we're doing this Holocaust. So you are here to pass on the knowledge to your children. So no one, so you would have to tell your children, oh, I don't know anybody else who believes in the Tawheed of Allah like you. And some of you subhanAllah are looking at me chill. Allah, you guys gotta wake up. You know there was a Libyan brother who became a Muslim. He was telling me this. He said, I became a Muslim. He said, I had no idea. One day I went into my attic and I'm searching through old pictures. And I find this picture of my great, great, great father from the 1930s. <laughs> and he's like, to my shock, he's wearing a kufi. <laughs> like I am right now. He's wearing a kufi. He's like, subhanAllah, he's wearing a kufi. Is that what, a uh, Jewish hawaka? I don't know what they call that. Hey, was he a Jew or something? But he was a full kufi like I am, right? He didn't have a turban, but he had a kufi. So he's like, was my grandfather a Muslim? And he did his research. You know what he found out? That his grandfather had immigrated from Libya as a Muslim. But because he became so busy with his gas stations and his restaurants and double shift jobs, he ended up marrying a Christian woman, and from there the downward slide began. Next generation became lost to Islam completely. Third generation, they probably met up some priests, became Christians. To a point that in 2010, he's a Christian and he had no idea that his roots are Muslim. When we don't do our job, that's what happens. But well, when he became a Muslim, he finally found out, subhanAllah, we are from a Muslim family. But you didn't know, because why? We became too busy with the fitna and distraction that unfortunately we have to face with. So the man of Pharisee once again gives up all these things, ends up in Turkey on Over there, he's studying the deen, and this time he started a business for himself. 
He said, I'm going to settle down and start my business. So I started doing his business. And the man in Amuria is about to die. And listen to this response. He goes to his bedside. He says, what's next? Who should I study next? The man says, Wallahi, I know of no one. Period. No one left that believes in the same way I do. But he says, but the time has come for the emergence of the final prophet. Now the time has come when the world is submerged in darkness. Where not a single priest has left who knows the tawheed of Allah. Now the light of prophethood is upon you. So the Prophet ﷺ comes upon the scene. Understand, understand this, my dear brothers, that the Prophet ﷺ came to pick up their slack. Is there any more prophets coming to pick up our slack? Tell me. Are there more prophets coming? Well, when did the Prophet leave in charge to do his work? He left you and me. You and me. It's our responsibility. Because Allah is sending no more messengers till the day. No more messengers are coming to pick up our slack and our laziness and to bring our heads out of the sand. You gotta do this job. So the matter of fantasy was told by this priest that this messenger will have three signs, clear signs. He does not eat from charity, but he eats from the gifts. If you give him food as a gift, he'll eat it, but not from charity. And he'll have a seal of prophethood on his back, and this prophet will emerge, and he gives two signs for the location. He'll be in Arabia, he said, in a land where there are a lot of rocky mountains and volcanic rock, and side of the city is surrounded by palm trees. So Salman al Farisi is now looking, again, willing to sacrifice every step of the way Allah tests him, he's willing to give up everything. And Allah will test you. You think you're just going to say you're Muslims and you're not going to be tested by Allah? He tested those before you. To a point that we have people who would say, I believe in Allah. And the king, evil king, would put him in a ditch, put a saw over his head. And say, give up your religion, I will cut you down. And the person will be cut in two pieces alive and he will not give up his religion. And here we are, some peer pressure in school and we're willing to cuss. Wallahi, my, my own student, my own student. He was told in his school, yo, he goes to school wearing a kufi. He's like, yo, take the kufi off, man, that ain't cool. He comes home complaining to his mom, mom, you, you're making me wear a kufi. Kids don't like it, I gotta take it off. Look at the peer pressure. Now I'm not saying you should be wearing kufis in school, but I, I'm just making a point. That's, that's what peer pressure is. Where was I? Salman al Farisi is willing to give up everything to go to Arabia. And finally, he hears of a caravan that's going to Arabia. He goes up to the merchants in the caravan and he says, You see this business of mine? Take everything. Take my sheep and my flock. Take me to Arabia. So these merchants, they're like, okay, cool, good deal. So they take him with them to Arabia. On the way to Arabia, they cheat him out of business, and they sell him as a slave. Oh. Now you're looking at this man, you're like, what a poor guy, right? But Allah, Allah is in charge, and he's controlling everything. Look what he has in for Sulaiman. And Allah, we have to put our trust in Allah. Well, no matter how bad the situation looks, know that the one who created you is always in charge. And reach out to him. Salman is sold as a slave, and the people from Wadi al Qura, which is close to Medina, they buy him. And he's like, I go to this land, I see a lot of palm trees. I'm like, man, perhaps this is the land where the final prophet is coming. So he was cool with it. A few days as a slave, and a man from Banu Qurayda comes. Where is Banu Qurayda? Let's get us some trivia. trivia answer. Where is Banu Qurayda? Anybody knows? Banu Qurayda. Let's see the knowledge of our youth. Banu Qurayda, Omar. Right next to Medina. Right next to Medina. What else? What do you also know about Banu Qurayda? And let me see, Habib. It was, it, was, uh, it was a tribe that had that, 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 that was supposed to be the Prophet Muhammad but then another, uh, another tribe met them and then this What was their religion? The Jews. the Jews. The Jews, right. They didn't like the Prophet too much. You know why? It wasn't from their family. It wasn't a Arab. It wasn't a Basi. I'm not accepting him. Screw him. Right? So the Jews didn't like the Prophet. He wasn't from their, the family of Ishaq alayhi salam. Anyways, so a man from Banu comes and buys him as a slave and takes him to Medina. Salman al Farisi said, Wallahi, when I laid my eyes on that land with rocky terrain and the palm trees, I knew this is the place. He said, I had no idea as a slave that the Prophet had already been on the scene for 10 years. 
And he's like, one day I was working on top of a palm tree. Palm tree. And my master is sitting underneath. And a man comes running. He's like, man, curse the others. Curse them. They are going to meet outside of the city to meet this name Muhammad, who claims to be a messenger of Allah. Salman, sitting on the top of the palm tree, says, Wallahi, when my ears heard the name messenger, I began to shiver. You know why he began to shiver? We don't shiver. Because this man has sacrificed his entire life for the truth. It values to him. For us, the deen was headed on a silver platter. So we don't care. But the Sahabas gave their life, blood, and sweat. So they moved and they shivered. He's like, I shivered and I was holding someone to land on top of my master. I got a control of myself. I came down. And I'm like, what did you just say? A messenger? And he said, my master punched me in the face. He's like, go do your work. None of your business. He said, but that night I prepared some food. And I wanted to go meet this messenger. And you know what he wants to do? He wants to test those three signs that the priest had told him. He's like, I went up to the prophet and he says, I heard that you guys are strangers. Now we're rich. I have some charity for you because I think you deserve it the most. So please eat. He said, I noticed the Prophet invited everybody, but he didn't eat. He's like, check the way He said, the next day, I came and said, you know, O Muhammad, I know you was a very good man. So the Lord He said, I know you was a very good man, but I saw yesterday you didn't eat from the charity I gave you. So guess what? Today I'll give you a gift. So he said, he invited the companions again, and this time he told Test number two. He said, when he passed the second test, He's like the third sign was left. Let's see who's following along. What's the third sign? What's the third sign? Yes. Speak it out loud. The, with the what? The seal. The seal of the prophet. Where is this supposed to be, by the way? In the back, right? Between the shoulder blades. He said, I tried to sneak around the prophet to see if I can get a view of his back. No, that's awkward, man. How am I supposed to ask him to take off his shirt? SubhanAllah, we're all men here, right? So he's like, I'm trying to sneak around. The prophet is an amazing leader. He's sensible. He saw a Salman trying to sneak behind him. He said, the Prophet was so beautiful in his manners, so gentle. He said, slowly he just let his arm, his back shawl drop. There in front of my eyes was the seal. And he said, my tears began to flow from my eyes. You know why? Because his entire life is flashing before his eyes. Giving up that home, giving up that comfort, moving to Iraq, moving to Isfahan, moving all giving up every comfort, slavehood for so many years, moving from all different places, learning new languages, all so he can finally come and witness this moment. He said, I fell down, hugged the Prophet and began to cry. And the Prophet picked him up and he said, what happened? Tell me your story. So he told the story to all the companions. And you know what they did to that story? They didn't just put it in books. They passed it on to their children. And they passed it on to their children. So 1,400 years later, I'm passing it on to you. That's how our deen works. You guys understand? That's how the next generation works. When we do our job of passing all these things so you can fight through those wedges. Fight through those wedges that have been bombarding you. I, inshallah, I want to conclude this story. There's so much that can be said about Salman al Farsi. I can't do justice to his life. I'll mention two more things and inshallah we'll, be, we'll do QA if you guys have. Salman al Farsi was one of the greatest scholars among the companions, teacher of Ibn Abbas himself. And because he had gone through all the this will flip you guys out. Some will be like, wow. Because he was such an amazing companion, all that he had gone through, his iman was on the sky. So when the Prophet passed away years after, check this out, guys. SubhanAllah, these companions were amazing. The companions are fighting who? The superpower of the time known as the Persian Empire. And Salman al Faris, which is from where? Persia. Who's leading the army? Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas. So in one of those battles, I'm not talking about the famous battle of Qasidiyya. It's a different battle. In this battle, Salman and Salman al Farisi and Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas, they're kind of at the head. Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas is the leader of the army. In one of the battles, what happens is the Muslims are chasing the Persians. In front of them is an ocean or a river. They can't even proceed further beyond, beyond, right? And across the ocean are who? The Persians. What do you do? There's no bridge that they can just cross over. Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas says, I have seen a dream last night. I saw a dream last night, and he, because of that dream, I don't know exactly what the dream was, but he looked up at the sky, and Salman al-Fahisi looked up at the sky, they're like, oh Allah, 
You know we have no means to reach these guys and fight them. O oh Allah, we have no means to cross the river and fight them. O oh Allah, make this water a bridge for us. With that, Salman al Farisi and Sa'ad al Nabi Uqas plunged their horses in the sea, and Tabari, in his famous work of history, records that the ocean was filled with horses, and the sea itself would support the Ummah of the Prophet as the horses crossed. So much so that the, the, the sea level would rise to support their ride. Umar bin Khattab hears about this in Medina. The Sa'ad has plunged his horses in the sea to cross the river. He writes a letter to every single commander of the army saying, that I heard Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas and Salman al Farisi have plunged their horses into the sea and they were able to cross. Make sure no other commander does this. None of you make sure that you do something crazy like this because Allah might have done it for Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas and Salman al Farisi because of their iman, he might not do it for you. This is the iman of Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas and Salman al Farisi because of which Allah made even the sea a support for them. And so for you. And every single one of you. You have that trust in Allah. You know your role models. Wallahi, when the companions would face these persons who are a superior civilization, you think they would fear inferior? They would used to say, are we going to follow the traditions of these fools? Now, we don't want us asking you to look down upon things. But understand that what Allah has given you is far better than anything that this culture can offer you. So, inshallah, with that in mind, I hope you guys, inshallah, learn about Salman al-Fadisi and leave as a better, more educated,